I really wish that I could stay, but I can't stay tonight. Uh, thank you for the food and everything. Uh, Dr. Kirka, uh, I have to speak here. Let me not apologize, but explain. <clears throat> Uh, these are my work clothes, but Dr. Kirk and I, time we get home tomorrow, will have traveled 1,800 miles in the last four days closing up churches. And uh, we've been in Ohio. I want to say this as a word of encouragement. This congregation uh, where we assembled, they have two weeks of intensive apologetics where all the members of 2,000 members in the congregation, now only 1,000 showed up. See? But they came with their Bibles and notepads, and these were lectures on apologetics, defending the Christian faith. Now, I don't know whether that sounds like New Testament Christianity to you, but it does to me. And these people are committed to transforming and saving, if possible, Christian education. All the elders are there. They check on them if they're not. 2,000 attend uh, members, 1,000 people at these meetings. And they've been all this week, and we came here, uh, and you said, well, I wish you had stayed in Columbus, Ohio, before I get done. But they have 10 days of apologetic, and people there work too. You know, we got to work and all. Well, they understand that, but they went from 9 o'clock till noon. And from 1 o'clock to 4, and from 7 o'clock to 10.30. None of that fidgeting business wins it over. You know, are we having fun? Anybody ask me, are you having fun? Fun's over as soon as you ask that. So with you here, we can't have fun. That ends that. But there are people who are committed to that. We just came from, uh, from that environment. And the brother, uh, well, there are... 12 PhDs in that congregation. No, who cares? But they're committed to Jesus Christ and their work is first of all Christian. And the preacher, he looked worse than Bob and I. And he was preaching. Preaching 2,000 people. And they have a 40 inch overhead projector. You know, I asked, asked your son if he had a projector and I didn't bring uh, dozens of overheads that I have because it'd be hard for you to see unless you have a the right equipment so I didn't have the time to check and see if it worked. But he sets and, and types out his message on the overhead projector as he speaks. An hour. If he hadn't got an hour to talk, it isn't long enough for you to be preaching. I want to tell you that because this is an exciting experience that Dr. Kirk and I have had. And uh, there are people who really care. There's a congregation in Alabama. Did you hear me? Some of you weren't here. Alabama? There's not even oxygen in Alabama. <laughs> but there's a congregation of 4,000 people in Alabama. Yes, said Alabama. And they do the same thing. They have two weeks of defense of the Christian faith. And that's not all they do, but that's the whole program and they expect everybody to be there. Now that business where we're working, well, quit working. we got stuff to do. There are people in this world that mean business about Christianity. Now, most people don't. But there are people who do. Amen. And I thank God for everyone who does that. And uh, I, I affirm you. But apparently tonight they're staying away in droves. And uh, you drove out a hundred uh, money changers last night from the temple. And uh, if you'd stay here a while, two or three of us will finish this out. There'll be none here. If you have to go, or you have to sleep while I'm talking, please don't snore and bother me because that interferes with my work. Do that. Now, anybody here teach? Now, I'll preach in a little while, but that's from 7 to 9 I'll preach. For the plan. <laughs> Any teachers here? Any thinker teachers? Now you're afraid. I'd be tempted. Well, this teacher. 
you know outcomes-based education, new age pantheism that controls the educational system of the university, you know that. If not, why not? This teacher, she had a pathological liar in class. Now, if there's no true truth, you can't be a pathological liar because you can't tell error. If there's no truth, there's no error. You realize that. But hurry up because, because of what? I don't know. Anyway. Patho and she school board wouldn't defend her. The principal would be fired, you know. Some cantankerous mother would get a civil liberties lawyer. Oh, you violated my son's identity and his integrity by spanking the little child. How, how, uh, how unacceptable that would be. She said, well, what am I going to do with that boy? She thought, well, tomorrow I'm going to tell him a lie. <laughs> See if that works. She goes to class and said, ladies and gentlemen, not, not boys and girls, that's a put down. See? But ladies and gentlemen, in fact, there weren't being many ladies and gentlemen there either, so that's also a lie. But people, persons, with no gender modification at all. She said yesterday, she said, I was driving down the road, and this road to my right was heavy wooded area. And it ran out of gas. And I was there for a few moments. Out of that woods came a giant bear and attacked my car and tried to get in and molest me with no lawyers or anybody to protect me. And she said, out of the woods came a little white dog and attacked that bear and ran that bear off. She said, do you believe that story? The boy raised his hand. Said, "Yes, ma'am." She said, "That was my dog. This is the second time this week he's done that." <laughs> you know. Now I was born in redneck territory in Southern Illinois, so you're in redneck territory. We've been through a lot of that here, and we used to have a hanging right after lunch, went to church, and then a hanging. Uh, that was just a cultural phenomenon. And in bloody Williamson County, that's where they run rot gut between Springfield or Frank, St. Louis and Chicago. Bloody Shelton gang, you, you know those. If you don't, you don't care. <laughs> when would you know what a redneck is? Well, a redneck is a father who takes his boy to the fourth grade and they're both in the same grade. <laughs> <laughs> A redneck is a person when the front porch falls down it kills six dogs. <laughs> That's right. I saw it today. Dead dogs and fallen porches. And redneck, and then this is this is it. it just quiet down. Because, uh, people said if I wanted to be a comedian, it's a million dollars a minute. And you haven't got the money. I realize that. So you, you funds that. Anyway, you know what a redneck is? Do you want to know what a redneck is? Well, look in the mirror. Well, <laughs> a redneck is a person with four cars up on the blocks in the backyard. That's enough. Tonight, uh, you've given me assignment. I appreciate that. Uh, based in Jeremiah 31 and others have talked about that. One of lay some foundation for that, but two metaphors I want us to keep in mind. Two metaphors, that's when you do something significant, you have to lay a foundation. Now my wife and I, along with 24 other million people, were in New York about a month ago. Uh, Four million people a day move into New York City to work, so you understand that's, that's a mission field. We were there, and I had seen it before, but we saw the Empire State Building. It used to be the world's tallest building, but that's not true. But in a world of the absence of truth, that's just as true as anything. It's not true still. But anyway, most people don't know that underneath that enormous building is 40 floors of steel and concrete. 
40 floors underneath that building. Now outsiders, you go and said, I said, do you, do you see those 40 floors down there? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll show you the engineering specs. But the people that built it had to put the foundation in. Now after it's built, you can't see the foundation, but it wouldn't stand without that. Amen. Found, it's a metaphor. Foundation. Where is the foundation for the kingdom of God, for the church? That's what it's all about. It's not story time. You do that for children. I, I quit going to high school picnics a long time ago. Foundation, a metaphor, and a bridge. Now in the same city is the Brooklyn Bridge. Bridge. There's bridges all over the world. And you know they moved uh, uh, London Bridge down to Arizona. And I, I don't know what on earth for at all. But they dismantled it and put it in Arizona. Now Alabama and Arizona. It'd be like taking up shop on the Gobi Desert. I don't know what for. But anyway, foundation and bridge. A bridge is something that moves us over impossible terrain. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn Bridge has 9,000 steel girders underneath that bridge. Well, I looked and I said, I want to count about 8,000 of those babies. I don't know anything about 9,000, but look at the engineering spec. What for? Because that bridge can turn 12 degrees when wind blows. But if people, the engineers that built that, didn't know that, that bridge had fallen down a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's structured. Bridge, foundations to build on. You've heard, you've heard of Jesus. I'm sure someone's mentioned his name. He said, you don't build on the sand? Mm -hmm. Well, some people are so weird in our culture, they build on the sand. But he said, you don't build on the sand. He said, well, you could be brain dead. You could be a college teacher or preacher and not do that. You know better than that. But two metaphors, foundation and bridge. Now what does Jeremiah 31, that was the assignment, so get pleased to say something about that, baby. Amen. Jeremiah 31 is about a new covenant. Who on earth cares about covenant, new or old? We're going to take a trek together, and again, I partly apologize for being back here ordinary. I, if I could speak for three days, I'd stand here. If I have to speak for 30 minutes, I have to go back there. See, it takes me two weeks to prepare for 30 minutes. It takes me about 10 seconds to prepare for four hours. So it has, someone has to control me. So I have control. It's the only reason I carry uh, notation uh, for control. I, have, I don't need the papers for talking. But someone has to control me, so I do that. But don't forget those paragraphs, those, those metaphors, foundation and bridge. I take those as two metaphors for the kingdom of God, for the church of Jesus Christ. And perhaps it's, it's uh, new or odd to you, but I want to say something because some of us un had the unfortunate uh, opportunity of attending the Restoration Heritage Forum at Dallas, Texas, a uh, little while back. And uh, you don't know nor care, but five years ago I had quadruple bypass and 32 blue codes. You know what that means. So I can't take Anderson, I meant to tell you that. I heard everything in the world except the Restoration Heritage. And I said, uh, uh, this, you'd have to be brain dead to talk like this. And I did scans on it and got horizontal brain, brain scans on most of the people that talk. But the Restoration Heritage stands or falls on there being truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now there might not be any, but put that down. And unity based on consensus to that truth. Now in the postmodern world, that simply means the world that controls the world that we live in. Like it or not, whether you've heard of it, I don't have time to discuss that with you. I just said, if you haven't, why not? Truth, it's possible, and unity by consensus. Do you ever try to get consensus out of three people? You can't even get consensus out of one person. 
They have a conflict within themselves. Our heritage stands or falls on the claim. Don't forget that. Now begin to commence in just a little while that there is truth and it's available. And there is unity, not because of our language, our ethnicity, or our gene code, or our environment, but because of our commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord Amen. here on earth. Now, without those, there's no point dealing with postmodern mind that denies truth. I tell all postmodern people, I say, if that's true, you can't even make a statement. I suppose you're preparing to tell me that it's true that there's no truth. No smarter than I am, I don't believe that. So, even on that basis, that sounds tolerant. Air tolerance is the big politically correct term. We, be, we tolerate everything. Okay. What's that? Because about the, the covenant that God and God that work in this world. I'm going to take a little track through that and uh, uh, get your Bibles. I will do dossiers on all people without Bibles. And uh, it, again, if you have to sleep, don't bother me while I'm talking. That's all right. It isn't all right, but that's all right. Hello? Yeah. Now you've heard, I'm assuming, and uh, for the sake of, <laughs> I've used up time, so I don't know the uh, sake of time. But for the sake of time, you know Jeremiah 31. Now just a brief word, and then a track, and then got to have something that sounds like a sermon. Huh? Even it, it, most people, like Elmer Gantry, or they say nothing but say it sonorously. That's most preaching. It wouldn't make any difference if they talked 10 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. They've said absolutely nothing whatsoever, but it was fun. I attempt to avoid that model at all costs. Jeremiah 31, I'll get to that because I realize that's my received assignment. My favorite verse of scripture is all of the promises of God are yes. That's an idiom, not an idiot, but an idiom for they're absolutely affirmed in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now two things in our little journey tonight. I want to encourage you that the Bible is unified by promise, not covenant. Amen. The Bible is unified by the promises of God and that Jesus Christ is the center of that promise. Amen. So just knowing the Bible, you, you could memorize unpointed Hebrew of Isaiah and go to hell. Or sight, read the Greek text of Romans and having the slightest notion of what's going on. So don't forget those metaphors, foundation, bridge. We got bridge over the world's largest world. We got foundation and bridges to cross. The world's fastest growing church is in China. The second fastest growing church is in Russia. The fastest growing religious phenomenon in the United States is New Age pantheism. <laughs> Not New Testament Christianity. I thought it was true. Why would you come a thousand miles or however far we came a thousand miles to be here? Why would you do that if you didn't believe so? Let me tell you this, if that offends you. I have degrees in offending people. So if I haven't offended you yet, just stay here a while. I'll certainly get to you. But I wouldn't go a thousand miles any place if I didn't believe something. And it has nothing to do with whether you listen, believe, pay any attention, or give a hoot. I know someone who does. And if you don't listen, that's your problem. We we'll talk a little bit about Jeremiah, put him, but we don't live in the age of Jeremiah. He's kaput. But we want to locate some foundation in Jeremiah and some bridges to us. This information and in a trek. The northern kingdom of Israel had fallen and Samaria, the capital city, had fallen in 722. 
Well, I thought God had made a promise to Israel. What's it doing falling? Every time Israel fell, Jeremiah, we'll get to Jeremiah, it's because they disobeyed the word. Every time they're responsible for the word. And when they don't hear, God sends, un sends unbelievers to judge his people. Always and inevitably. Now the southern kingdom is in crisis. That's the prophetic period of Isaiah and Micah and Nahum and Jeremiah. Get to old Jeremiah because that's the assignment. Now the fall of Jerusalem was in 586. What had happened in Jeremiah's world is that that kingdom was falling apart. Now the people of God was falling apart. Were falling apart or collectively was falling apart. Why? Because they'd gone to idolatry. They'd gone to immorality. Well, how can the people of God do that? How long will God let them do that? Not long. Not long. How long will it? God isn't contingent on America. If America is in crisis, moral crisis, he just bypass that and get somebody else. He's always done it. He'll do it again. Jeremiah, fall of Jerusalem. Now, don't forget, in the theology of promise, the centrality of the land, centrality of the temple, centrality of the priesthood, centrality of the sacrificial system, and in Jesus, he fuses all of those. Amen. So it's not just a, a history lesson that I hate. What you could do with history, if you had a PhD from Harvard in history, all you could do with it is teach it. You can't change it. Uh, it's been re rewritten today, but theoretically you can't change it. And it has nothing. What does that have to do with me? Got all these dates and all these weird names. I was going to give you a list of these weird names, but you don't want those weird names. But the very heart of Jeremiah's message was gloom and doom because of Israel's unbelief. Now they're the people of God. They're the church members. So if the church members are kaput, where do you think everybody else is? Now why did God, is it not of God, that he would have chosen Israel? Do you have any idea how small Palestine is? It's 160 by 62 miles wide. And it's, it's like the Gobi Desert. And you know, we're having a war, constant conflict between the Arabs. And, you heard about that? Well, see, that stems... From uh, one of the treks we'll take in a minute, when Abraham, this 90-year-old man. Now you can go to the medical school and get a possibility analysis of a 90-year-old man producing a lineage that will deliver the Messiah. But that would be nil. This 90-year-old man is promised something. In thy seed shall all the nations of the world. Now, don't forget that's Goyim long before Matthew 28 and go to the ethnics and go to the, the Gentiles. <laughs> that's, over, that's over Israel and the Gentiles and the church and all the things. A 90-year-old man? Now, you really have to be kidding. That's not humanly feasible. But it's out of his loins will come the tribes, the son, and the son. Mm -hmm. See, God promised it. Amen. But that's an odd thing. A 90-year-old man, you ought to have a 20-year-old buck on that. 90-year-old man. See, but when God promises, God fulfills the promises. And Amen. they're all affirmed. Yes, they're asserted, yes, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, what about the covenant? Well, covenant is subsidiary to the promise. There are 29 covenants in the Old Testament. We'll talk about two or three of them in a minute. But at the heart of Jeremiah's world and his message was gloom and doom and judgment. Then all of a sudden in the midst of, of this gloom and doom discussion, he said, God's going to have a new covenant. What's wrong with the old one? They haven't paid any attention to it. Well, what will be new about it? We'll take a little trek about that. 
two groups of people, I think, distort, besides our heritage, in my estimation, distorts the whole issue of the covenants. We're New Testament people. The Bible of the early church was the Old Testament. So if you don't know the Old Testament, you can't possibly understand the New Testament. Other than that, it doesn't make any difference. So Israel, uh, Judah, south part. Now notice, you were here, Israel and Judah, that's north and south. What's the people of God doing being divided? Yeah. We're unity people, aren't we? You couldn't even unify the people of God. But see, God got to both of those groups. Amen. He'll always do that. You can be divided if you want to about anything. Just have a list of reasons for pouting or something. But see, when God comes to work, that's the end of the pouting. Amen. That's end. See, because God's promise will be real. There's no Hebrew word for promise. Aren't you glad to know that tonight? But there's the Hebrew word that's translated promise. It's the Hebrew word for word. Devar! There are no ten commandments or ten words. Well, so what? Because word in the Hebrew Bible is revelatory and creative. When God speaks, there's revelation and something happens. He doesn't just jabber. Yes. Amen. 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 So it's translated into English as promise. Now notice, human beings can promise people and can't even morally, can't fulfill them. See, but the God who's created quarks and mesons and positrons and the DNA code and the complexity of the universe, he's the one that's promised. Amen. And he will fulfill his promises. Amen. He is able to fulfill his promise, even when people pay no attention to him. But see, they pay no attention for just a little while. He'll let us individually or nationally run its gauntlet. And here he comes. America better get on its knees in prayer. Amen. The church better get off its duff in powerful exposition of the word and witness Amen. to the world. Amen. Right away, if not sooner. Now what Jeremiah was inserting in the midst of despair and judgment, that's negative. We don't want negative preaching. We want short preaching. We want it funny. We want it, do not destroy my comfort zone or annihilate my self-image. I said, ma'am or sir, I didn't eliminate your self-image. You didn't have one. <laughs> Students used to say, said, now you make me feel inferior. I said, no. You are inferior. I didn't make you inferior. Don't, don't blame me. You come that way. He said, what? Well, put Jeremiah in the context. The north fallen, the south has fallen. And God sends a spoke, what for? To call them to repentance. Why they need to repent? Because Judah had gone into idolatry. See, even in the midst of people denying God's existence, they create idols. We have idols coming out of our ears in our culture. Not the least of which is sports. That's an idol without any question. We worship it. We're controlled by it. Our time, our mindset. Uh, just whatever that is they're having uh, in, in the United States now for two weeks. They've already spent $5 billion. And they're going to spend $5 billion more dollars in Atlanta. For what? Fun and games. Oh, my. We fidgeted it 12 minutes in church, but I've got to get to, what, seven hours of that. Oh. We're all in trouble. There's no point in me sending you to a doctor because he can't help. <coughs> Jeremiah, New Covenant. Put Jeremiah in the context of his world. And that, that would be imperative. Put Jeremiah's message so right in the midst of gloom and doom is hope. Yes, yes. The new covenant. But without knowing Jer you need to do Je uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. You need to know minimum. Just even start on the subject you, you graciously give me, and I will address it a little bit. Would take a minimum of control over five Old Testament books. 
and how this subject matter is used in the New Testament. And that's just to start with, and you, you want me to hurry up and get done. Jeremiah. Now the text said that he was a weeping prophet because he cared. And in the Bible, only Jeremiah and Jesus wept. He wept over Jerusalem because they didn't hear. Jeremiah wept because he cared. So it's not just some cantankerous mega church guru, CEO, standing in the pulpit, making inane remarks for 12, 15 minutes so we can have a $5 million staff infection or something in the church. But God's at work in this whole universe, and we'll take a little unfolding of these premises. Now, God, you know the Bible, and I assume that our brothers that have talked uh, in the past week on these things, they're just rehearsing them again. The first covenant that we have, the first promise we have, is God to Adam. He promised that God would do something. Now, at that time, he had no way of knowing what or how. But God's in control of that promise. Amen. And then we have a covenant, a bereath. You want to know about that, too? Covenant with Noah. You remember that in Genesis 6 and 8? Now, the scope, the scope of that covenant was universal. Mark that down. Because the new covenant's with Israel. That's quite a small group of people. Now, the next is the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. Now, the scope of the covenant with Abraham is universal. The Noahic covenant was based on God's providential preservation of all life. God's in control. That's the foundation of his promise. And only God could fulfill it. Amen. Now, the covenant with Abraham, on the other hand, is the basis of God's redemptive work. The covenant with Noah was over creation, fallen creation. First Hebrew word that trans, could be translated sin, but that's too nubulous to be meaningful today. It's ra, means a violent rebellion against order. And sin rebelled against man and God. Man and himself. That's why half the people in the ministry are in, in counseling. They need counseling and they give counseling to the counselees. So how all of a sudden in the culture do so many people come unglued? Pressure. Families, churches, communities, nations come unglued. There have always been unglued people, but not the mass statistic that's present in our culture, in and out of the church. Rebellion against God and man's relationship. Rebellion against man and his own, who he is. Rebellion against man and nature. See, our culture, we have millions of people that are marching in Washington about the spotted owl or orangutans or, or trees. You're cutting too much trees. That's why a paper costs so much because the environmentalists see it clamping down on cutting trees down because most paper comes from trees. You know that. And I need, I need at least $3,000 worth of paper a month in the work that I'm doing. See, But it costs too much. It's not in the budget. But environmentalists, now notice, our environment's fractured, isn't it? But we have legal foundation for a million and a half legal abortions. I don't have any way of knowing however many abortions there are. I said a million and a half. So that's legal, but you can't cut down trees and spot it owls. Well, a culture that does that does not have law. At all. Well, what's that about sin? Because God sits a promise, then he creates covenants to unfold the answer to, to that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That, if you can't wait, that's what little sermon that I have. God creates an answer to the problem. What's the problem? If you know what the problem is, you have no idea what the solution is. At all. So God creates a covenant with Noah for one thing. He creates a covenant 
with Abraham for another thing. And then move, of course, these things have been discussed, I'm sure, by others. Then the Sinaitic Covenant in Exodus 19. Now notice, what are you doing with all those covenants? Well, God keeps unfolding a promise to each one of those perimeters of covenant. When he does a bereath, though, there, there are more covenants than there are with God's people in the Bible. There are human covenants and the Susan Tree Babylonian covenant, but we'd discuss that if we were in school, but right here we're not going to do that. The scope of the covenant in the Sinaitic covenant is national. The two other covenants were universal. But Abraham, see, God cuts a covenant with Abraham. In thy seed, Hebrew is plural. Who gives a hoot? Paul quotes that in Galatians and takes that as singular. And he identifies that seed as that promise to be Jesus Christ. Amen. So there are seeds. Of course, you have to have the seeds before you get to the seed. All these covenants are going to unfold in Jesus. Amen. 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 They're not just abstract things for covenant theology or premillennial dispensationalism. Amen. God's at work. Amen. Amen. He said and he will accomplish it. Now, human beings to be human beings instead of clones or genetic aberrations or uh, minor computers have to be free, but we're not free to determine the consequences of the freedom. God's in control of the consequences. Amen. So man is not an animal. He isn't a machine. He isn't a cadaver. Well, some are, but I shouldn't say that. Then a third covenant is with the house of David. Now, notice a little bit at a time. Now, you remember the story of David. You've had this one, you youth up. She can't stay, so she's going away. David. Now, David, he writes the Psalms. We sing, you sing those. Don't anymore. Of course, those don't rock enough. Yeah, the pathology of our culture shows up in our music also, and audios and videos. And two most powerful shaping forces in our culture are education and, and media. Okay? God, only God could survive either one of those. So there are proofs for me in my apologetics for the existence of God. Because only this God could survive what's going on. Well, David's house, you remember, he murdered someone. And he played musical beds with the wrong woman. But David did repent. He said, oh, I'm sorry. But only God could forgive him because being sorry for something that's already done, you can't do anything about that except forgive it. Now watch that because that'll be one of the five things that I will call her all your attention if you're here. Now, the covenant with David is exposed in 2 Samuel 7. I do not agree with Kaiser that that's the only passage about David's household, but notice the promise, the covenant with the house of David. Then the son of David will be the Messiah. The house of David, see now in Jeremiah's day, what had happened with the leaders in the house of David, they were all corrupt. But God had promised the house of David that he would deliver the answer. We can't, with these crumbs, you can't do that. They belong in maximum security prison. Well, but God's going to bypass that. And, Amen. and then he gets Josiah around with these kids playing and, and making pictures and things. Josiah was just a kid. What are you doing? What are you doing? Making a boy the king of the land. And then in about 12 or 13 years, this foolish boy, he hadn't been to camp, no Sunday school, so he didn't find out there. God's going to use Josiah for revival in Israel. A revival is not just a nice meeting where you want the speaker to come back next year and the singing groups to come again because, oh boy, were they good. Good for what? Nothing generally. But when the world is altered, that's a revival. Church desperately, and evangelism is not a synonym for revival. Only the people of God can be revived. Amen. A revival is not evangelism, but you hear that. David was a murderer, an adulterer, and yet God had, did a covenant with David. Your house 
will deliver the Messiah. Well, you're going to get rid of this crud. Got to get. Here's Jeremiah. Now the revival in the land was short-lived, the Jeremiah. But what that fool did, spot the covenant. What Josiah did when he was 23 years old. Why he encouraged the priest. Now catch this. He encouraged the priest to go look in this worn down temple. They destroyed the temple. And what did they find? What well, it said they found, found, found in, in the church office, they found the Torah. This is no place to discuss whether that was the Pentateuch or Deuteronomy. That's futile discussion to start with. But if you need to write a 30-page technical paper on it, I'd say that's a futile enterprise for you to do. But they found the word of God and what happened? They read it from morning. Didn't anybody have to work? Anybody have to go to school? They read it from morning to night and the people wept. They hadn't heard the word of God for so long. Amen. Revival in the nation. But that didn't last very long. Because that part of the people of God is going into captivity. The north went into Syrian captivity. But those are pagans, aren't they? It's not like the Harvard Divinity School or something like that. <laughs> and the south went into Babylonian captivity. Well, neither one of those are going to speak at the Kaimichis. Those are pagans. See, God told his people, if you don't listen, I will send the unbeliever to set in judgment on you. Now, it doesn't mean the unbeliever was saved. But God wouldn't tolerate their disobedience. He sends unbelievers to warn them and destroy them and kill them. How long? I don't know how long. He's always done it. Always done it. So we have three covenants. Three covenants. And uh, the, the covenant program uh, is, is uh, uh, an unfolding. Noah, Abraham... Sinaitic covenant in the house of David and in Jeremiah 31, and that's the assignment. But see, all those covenants are related to God promising something and the whole history of Israel. And the house of David would show up in the son of David, the Messiah. But David had a lot of crummy sons. But this son's in the line. In the line to answer the problems that sin created. Amen. Jesus is tired of both Old and New Testament, not just the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I do not talk, even at, at meetings like this or superficially, about we're a New Testament church. I don't even know what that means. Oh, I know what you think it means, but I don't know what it means. So covenant, covenant, covenant. See, I'm not a covenant theologian. I'm a promise theologian. Because the promise transcends the covenant. The covenant is subsumed, subsumed underneath that. <clears throat> Jeremiah, new covenant. Well, what was wrong with the old covenant? They hadn't paid any attention to it. Now, just for remaining a minute or two, we're going to unpack some factors in Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. What's new about it? Well, technically, nothing. Because the theme that you, you gave me was, I will be your God, and you should be my people. But it does never mean that they will be his people whether they obey or not. God is not a Calvinist. Amen. But he will be his God always. Just to locate that and then four or five little points. A quotation in Romans, which I hold to be the magnum opus of missions, the epistle of the Romans, is a quotation Habakkuk, you know that. Now the issue is just a tiny, tiny bit, not much, just a tiny bit of superficial academia. The Hebrew text of Habakkuk is ambiguous. Uh-huh, it really is. Well, I thought it was inspired. Watch it. 
Hebrew text could be translated, the just shall live by God's faithfulness. Or the, from the reformers forward, the just shall live by faith as though it's individual faith. I believe that the text is inspired because of its ambiguity. Without God's faithfulness, our faith wouldn't amount to anything. Amen. Amen. So without his faithfulness to the promise, it wouldn't make any difference about human faith. So I think, without any question, technically, that the Hebrew text of Habakkuk is ambiguous for that reason. God could have said, or Habakkuk could have said in Hebrew, either way, but he put it, it could be either way. But the translators, uh, uh, Paul in Romans, takes it from the Septuagint in the singular. The faith shall live, I mean, the, by faith, like it's individ your faith. Individ from the reformers forward, that's how it was understood. But I say both of those things are present in the Bible. Not either one, but both of them. God's faithfulness in our faith. So God's faithfulness could get us into universalism because God's faithful. That's where you get barred in contemporary universalism in, in all over the, the religious world. Everybody's saved. Everybody's in. Nobody's. Because God loves everybody. Nobody's out. It's not politically correct to talk about heaven or hell or sin or responsibility. But I say, uh, if I haven't said anything politically incorrect yet, just hold on. I will say it. But Habakkuk, intentionally ambiguous. The righteous shall live by his faithfulness and or, without violating the text at all, the righteous shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. Whose faith? Without his, ours won't mean a thing. Marvelous, marvelous, necessary Amen. insight. Now we unpack uh, to get to Jeremiah. Hurry up, hurry up, get there. Holy Spirit, Joel, Day of Pentecost. I think Day of Pentecost was the beginning of the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31. Because in the Old Testament, everybody didn't have the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, only elite leaders, prophets, priests, and kings. And in Jesus, he'll fuse those prophet, priest, and king. But if you look through the genealogical records, you'll see some strange division between Matthew and Luke, but the division is over protecting those three categories of who Jesus was. Yes, you would. The new covenant and the spirit of God. The creation of the church. This is not the place to discuss the relationship of Israel and the church. Premillennialism, amillennialism, dispensationalism, I'm none of those things. Amen. All of them are divisive Amen. and insoluble. Amen. So you can hold them, I suppose. I'm sure you could because many do. But I don't care really. You go ahead and be wrong. It's hard with me. I got things to do. These four things I ask us all to think about. The substance of the new covenant is the essence of the assignment. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. But not in spite of obedience. The whole history of Israel is proof of that. Whole history of the church is, is proof of that. Amen. That God's faithful but not to disobedient people because he'll send judgment. Always has, always will. Think about these four things. The new covenant is about a new relationship with God. Well, sin broke man's relationship with God. Why didn't the covenant with Abraham and Moses, sin, the Attic covenant, why didn't it create transformed hearts? See, what happens is they misunderstood the nature of God's revelation and they became legalistic Pharisees and Sadducees. They thought if they just memorized the Hebrew text, unpointed, of course, the uh, unpointed Hebrew text, that they'd be saved. But their lives weren't changed at all. Yeah. But they did win Bible Bowl. <laughs> I'm not disinterested in that, but I'm just not very interested in it. 
Why? Because by no means does that mean there's transformation of those that hear and speak. Amen. The Word of God says when God speaks, all hearts open to God will hear. And to hear in the Bible is not just to listen. Did you hear that? Amen. But it's obedience. Amen. Obedience is action. Amen. Obedience is a lifestyle. Christianity is not merely going to church, getting the kids out of bed when they don't want to, and eating cereal they don't like to eat, to get them to church in time. They sit there and pout. Mm. You've seen them like that. Passive aggressive, you've seen that. New relationship with God. Now, what was wrong with the old one? Well, they didn't have one with God. That's right. See, they confused their misunderstanding of the Torah with the word of God, God created Israel to deliver the Messiah to save Jews and Gentiles and 7,000 ethics and languages and dialects in the world. He didn't just save them in order that Israel be saved. That's, right. That's why in Romans 9, 10, and 11, the most extensive discussion of the relationship of God's promise to Israel and the church, you got three chapters in Romans right. over the Jews. And no, the Jews return to Palestine and the Jewish Arab wars is not fulfillment of prophecy. A second thing, a new experience of forgiveness. Now God will forgive anyone who repents. But repentance is not a preoccupation of the megachurch or political correctness. Because it's offensive. You mean I've done something that I should repent of? Uh-huh. Well, I'll think about it. Well, you shouldn't spend a lot of time thinking. You better get with it. Amen. A new experience of forgiveness. Now, when Israel, there's revival, Josiah, all those things. They return to holiness, to holy living. They return. Now, you use the word, the glory of God. I thank you for that. Kobad, and the Greek word doxa, doesn't mean light. <laughs> Kobad and doxa means his presence. The glory of God is about God's presence. And when the name was written Ichabod over the temple, God wasn't there anymore. So his glory, thank you for all these words, but it'd take hours unfold. But the glory of God is where and among whom is God present. He's present among those who believe. Now, not just believe, period, but believe him. Now, the text doesn't say that Abraham believed that there was a God. It says that he believed God. Amen. Saying that God said something to him and he believed him. Amen. It was not a discussion between deism and atheism and contemporary multicultural panentheism. It was an affirmation. He believed what God said to him. And he believed what God said. He acted. Amen. We can't say we believe what God says. And then sit on our duffs. And do nothing about it. And say what are you going to do about it? I was in New York. And I was closing up churches there. And uh, there's a, a singing group. I happened to be talking about Generation X. Pathological description of the youth culture. And. I uh, knew this lady was not uncontrollably excited about this. I could tell this. And when it was over, she came. She said, I, I do hear what you're saying. But she said, what are we to do about it? I said, ma'am, get off your duff. She said, oh, all kinds of things you can do about it. I didn't create the problem. I'm neither God nor magician. But I do know what you're going to have to do to address that. Now, if you'll pay the price, I can tell you. But if you won't pay the price, I can't tell you. She said, oh. She's probably still saying, oh. But she'll never forget. Watch his name. <laughs> Relationship with God. A new experience of forgiveness. A new obedience to the word of God. Oh, how the church desperately needs to hear Jeremiah 31 in its context. Amen. Not just do Jeremiah. I mean, we'd be still in, in dead Israel, dead Judah in Jeremiah. But a new obedience of the word of God. And that means that people care about the word of God. 
Amen. That means that God has spoken and he will not speak anymore in the great prologues of John's gospel and the Hebrew epistle. The text is, they're marvelous. It said, God having spoken, imperfect tense, just a slight bit of grammar. That meant he kept speaking. And then it said, in Christ, he has spoken, aorist tense, all the speaking he's going to do, he's done in Jesus. Amen. He kept speaking, but now he's done all the talking he's going to do. Amen. Verb forms are quite essential for preaching what that text says. God kept talking through the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, all the prophets. But when we got to Jesus, that was the prophet. Yes. Amen. That was the key. Amen. That was the essence of all the promise and all the covenant structure is Jesus. All the promises are yes. yes. Just an idiom for saying they're affirmed. Mm -hmm. In Jesus. Yeah. Doesn't mean yes to it. That's not what it means. They're firm. Jesus. So you don't have to know one point in Hebrew of Isaiah to be saved, but you have to know Isaiah's suffering servant. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You don't have to know the theological content of the, all the covenants in the Old Testament to be saved, but you have to know that the promises of God are affirmed in Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no way out but that. New obedience to the law. Last, oh, thank God for this. this you know God's at work when somebody gets to the last point. A new obedience. Now, no, what's this? Of nature. Now, what's nature got to do with it? Because God created the universe and he wants every inch of it back. Amen. So a church that merely tries to have a big Sunday school or five, fifteen, or eighteen million attenders. The largest church in the world is Cho in Korea, seven hundred thousand. But it's also the health and wealth gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, God wants you healthy and wealthy. Well, no wonder you get a lot of attenders. Mm -hmm. After a while, though, you see that's not true, and then you pass out among them. But how that's influenced the mega church and church growth movement in the United States chose is, is a guru of those influences in America. He's also the guru of the small group. Now God knows that he's not, and I'm not opposed to small groups because you can't have fellowship with 700,000 people. But see, small groups can produce cliques. Now, if you've got 10 or 12 people in prayer and Bible study, I'm not afraid of that. But 10 or 12 people have spent an hour eating and laughing and telling all the pathology that happened in their life the week before is not exactly kingdom-transforming phenomena. Amen. Now, God, another, God, in Jeremiah, I promise, a new house of David, because the house of David was kaput. But the house of David will be in the son of David. Look and compare Matthew and Luke's genealogical tables. And the one is an affirmation of those three dimensions of Jesus. They look different, and if you're a Harvard skeptic, you'd say, well, these are contradictory make perfectly good sense if you'd come with me for a little while. One goes to Adam and one locates Jesus in all those parameters. Mm -hmm. Those are different movements for different reasons. A new house of David? Not just the old Davy, this adulterous murderer uh, would have a prolongation of his children. But the house of David would produce the son of David. Now David didn't know that. But God promised that. huh? Amen. And God fulfilled it long after David was in the grave. God promised Abraham and he fulfilled it long after Abraham was in the grave. God promised to Moses and to Israel long after they're all in the grave. 
but his promise is still at work. Amen. A new covenant? What's new about it? A new abundance of nature. Now, this is not health and wealth affirmation. Mm -hmm. This is not for civil liberties union and environmentalists to go crazy over. It's an affirmation that God controls the universe. And if man distorts it, whether the air or the water or whatever, you'll pay for it. And only a Christian view of creation can respond to the chaos in the environment. Only a Christian view can respond to the chaos in Generation X, the counterculture, or any of the hot buttons of the world's political chaotic scenes. God can answer those, but the conditions are, I will be your God, not that I'd like to be. Won't you have a committee meeting and see if you'd like me? I will be your God and you shall be my people. Amen. If you obey my word. See, God has displaced people not because he didn't like Israel. He elected Israel. Didn't he? Mm -hmm. But out of Israel came the Messiah. But unbelieving Jews are no safer than unbelieving pagans. Paul says in Romans, therefore all Israel shall be saved. Well, yeah, all Israel has always been the people that believed. He never at any time, the prophets never at any time said every Jew is saved because God got a covenant with, with Israel. Without your faithful attendance to the word, you haven't got a chance any more or any less than anybody else. God doesn't have a different gospel for the Jews and a different gospel for the Gentiles, the Gentiles or the tribes or the ethnics. He doesn't have different gospels. Amen. He got the same one. In fact, he's never changed it from the very first day that he spoke. Amen. 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 Jeremiah is just one of the places in a crisis of the people of God that had not heard and they were growing weary of hearing. Weary of hearing. Listen to that. How marvelous it is a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Wellington was in conflict with Napoleon. And word came across the English Channel. Wellington defeated. All of England was in despair until the full message came across. Wellington defeated Napoleon. They never listened to the full message very long. But when it came, they heard it, and all of England wept and prayed. Quite often we hear part of the message and we're in despair. But if we heard all the message, we're not in despair. Amen. Amen. It's about the covenant. If we went to the cross, we'd be in despair. But if you just hang around with me for three days, I just challenge you to find any skeletal remains or DNA analysis of anybody's that are there, and you would have refuted the Christian message and the promise of God. God's promise was ultimately answered in the cross, but that's negative. Resurrection. Whoever, whoever and whatever answers the problem of sin and death is God. Amen. Amen. New covenant? Well, God's been on a journey for a long time to unfold that. That's not new. It's only new to those that haven't heard. But it's a myth that that was new. He's going to write it on the heart. Well, he's always wanted to have done that. And then that shows up in the preaching of the gospel. Paul in Corinthians, you know, 
written letter, written on you, you know, all that, all that has to be unfolded. The very things that's in Jeremiah is identical with what Paul says in the yeah. Corinthian correspondence. Amen. Day of Pentecost is the beginning of the fulfillment. Holy Spirit speaking the word, living the life, and outliving those around about them in this final moment. Have you ever thought very long why God would have chosen the Jews to save the world? Do you have any idea the potential failure of that? Do you have any idea why God would have chosen a 17-year-old pregnant, unmarried Jewish girl to deliver the one who created quarks and positrons and DNAs? 17-year-old pregnant, unmarried Jewish girl. God does the strangest things. He always has. Why would he have chosen the 12 apostles? Do you have a CEO dossier on those babies? Those are all losers. They certainly didn't have any Harvard MBA on their dossiers. He chose the weirdest people in the world because in his hand, he's created before and do it again, God. He's created out of nothing before. And see, God always takes the nothing to show you that he is in command. Amen. Amen. Now, it might not look like today. Grandma died. Uncle Ben died of AIDS. But he's in command. Every cemetery will be emptied. Amen. Every hospital bed will be emptied. He's in control. Whatever else, that's Jeremiah 31. New covenant? Why did Israel need a new covenant? What was wrong with the old? They hadn't paid any attention to it. When they pay attention, they'll be new. always new when you hear something again for the first time so my encouragement to all of us not merely you but me we've got to hear the word of God again for the first time yes. that's just one of the things I'll be your God you'll be my people but he'll always be God whether we're his people is contingent on our obedient response Shalom, shalom like I am.